God's sake, Roger. You're still not dressed. <laughs> Are you not coming to Mass with me? Uh, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> what the hell is this? How can this be real? <laughs> Oh my god, I'm freaking out. This is amazing. Wait a minute. A grey scarf. With this jacket. Not in this lifetime. No, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. How is any of this real? How did you bring me here? Soma is a survival horror game published and developed by Frictional Games and released for PC and PS4 in September of 2015 with an Xbox port coming two years later. Frictional Games had found massive mainstream success only a few years earlier with their previous game, Amnesia The Dark Descent, so expectations were high for their next title. However, some people were disappointed when they discovered that Frictional would not be developing another Amnesia game, and would instead be developing a brand new IP, while developer The Chinese Room would handle production of the next Amnesia title, Amnesia, a machine for pigs. While Amnesia's brand of horror was very Lovecraftian in nature, Soma is an entirely different beast, choosing to instead base its horror on abstract ideas like transhumanism and what it really means to be alive. Soma received positive reviews upon its initial release, with many critics praising the game's plot and atmosphere. However, some critics found the game to be considerably less scary than Amnesia, at least from a gameplay perspective, with some going as far as to say that they wished the monsters had been removed from the game entirely. Soma is a game I've wanted to cover on this channel ever since I completed it three years ago. However, I'm not exactly the smartest guy in the world, and I wanted to make sure I did the game justice. So I decided to research several of the abstract and out there concepts that Soma loves to throw at the player in a feeble attempt to come across as somewhat coherent during the course of this review. Hopefully that 15 minutes of hard work will pay off. I should quickly mention that this review will essentially spoil the entire plot of Soma. So if you haven't played the game yet, you should probably click away now, unless you genuinely have no interest in playing it. Personally, I would highly recommend that you play the game before watching this video. The various ways that Soma will fuck with your head needs to be experienced firsthand. This video alone simply won't be able to adequately convey the sheer amount of existential dread you'll feel by simply playing this game. I understand that some people find playing horror games to be too stressful an experience. But if you fall into that category, Soma mercifully includes a safe mode option that essentially turns the game into a glorified walking simulator and lets you enjoy the story and puzzles without having to worry about all that hide and seek bullshit. With all that out of the way, let's begin this review. Consider this your final spoiler warning. In Soma, you play as a young man named Simon Jarrett. The game begins with Simon dreaming about the night he was in a car accident that he was fortunate enough to survive. Well, maybe fortunate isn't exactly the right word to use, as he ended up suffering serious head trauma from the crash that will eventually kill him. On top of that, his ex-girlfriend was also killed in the crash. Despite all this, Simon is surprisingly upbeat at the beginning of the game, which I found to be slightly bothersome. I mean, 
When my ex-girlfriend recently died under mysterious circumstances, I was not upbeat in the slightest, regardless of what police reports from the time might say. Well, it turns out the reason Simon is feeling in good spirits again is because he's been in contact with a doctor who claims that he has been working on new technology that should theoretically be able to cure Simon's cranial bleeding and turn the few months he has left to live into a few decades. Upon reaching the doctor's lab, Simon finds Muncie setting up the brain scanning machine and has a few questions for him. These questions mostly revolve around the brain scan itself and how it's supposed to heal Simon's brain injury. The doctor theorizes that by scanning the various parts of Simon's brain, he should be able to apply different stimuli to each area in the hope of finding something that will stop the bleeding. Simon doesn't want to waste any more time than is necessary, so he sits in the chair and once he begins the brain scan. Say cheese! Things go dark for a few moments before Simon emerges in an entirely different room to the one he was just in. It turns out that the brain scanning machine was actually a time machine. That lying genius bastard. Okay, so that's not entirely true. Simon hasn't just leapt through time. Not in the traditional sense anyways. But he's clearly no longer living in the year 2015 either. The place he finds himself in looks like something straight out of a 1970s sci-fi horror movie, like Alien. It's futuristic, but not in the traditional sense. It's a dark, frightening place, and the sudden juxtaposition between Muncie's office and here causes Simon to start panicking. Eventually, Simon composes himself and begins searching the halls of this strange alien place. He tries to find another person to help him make sense of what has just happened, but the area is completely devoid of human life. All he finds are strange robot-like creatures and walls covered in an odd, unknown substance. Eventually, Simon discovers that he has somehow ended up in an underwater research facility named Patos 2, which is situated somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. Simon decides to keep searching the facility in the hopes of finding answers as to how he ended up here. Shortly afterwards, he finds a damaged robot lying on the ground. To restore power to the area, we essentially need to unplug this robot from the wall, but doing so causes the machine to become upset, claiming that it was happy before it dies shortly afterwards. The machine was behaving in a very human-like manner before it died, which might cause some players to feel guilty for unplugging it in the first place. After restoring power to the area, a human voice is heard coming from a nearby computer. The woman is a researcher on Patos 2. She is currently situated in a different area of the facility, named Site Lamba, so Simon sets off to meet her, in the hopes that she might understand what the hell is going on right now. In the next area, the player encounters their first hostile creature in the game, and it is here where some of Soma's biggest flaws become quickly apparent. Just like in Frixino's previous game, Amnesia The Dark Descent, players cannot fight back against the monsters in this world, and so instead have to hide and try to quietly sneak past them whenever the opportunity arises. This by itself isn't a bad thing. Games like Alien Isolation and Outlast relied on this concept to wonderful effect. The problem with Soma is that its monsters simply aren't threatening. As many others have already pointed out, the first monster in Soma doesn't look intimidating at all. If anything, it looks friendly. This probably had the knock-on effect of convincing several players to actually walk up to the thing during their first playthrough to see if they could converse with it, which I doubt is what Frictional was going for. And once they did so, they would quickly realize that being attacked by these creatures carries very little penalty at all. You'll simply get back on your feet a few moments later, and the monster will have fucked off to a different point on the map. It is possible to get a game over, but it's very uncommon, since you need to be attacked several times for it to occur. I've seen many people claim that Soma isn't a very scary game at all, and I find that to be a very subjective statement. 
While I may not have found the game to be all that unsettling, there were definitely moments where I felt tense and on edge. A handful of jump scares also managed to get a reaction out of me. I would even go as far as to say that if this was the first horror game someone ever played, they would probably find it to be a truly terrifying experience. However, as someone who has played an unhealthy amount of these games by this point, a lot of Soma's horror fell flat, at least from a gameplay perspective. A lot of the monster encounters felt more frustrating than anything. There was this one moment where I had to install this device in an elevator panel, but this fucking guy would not leave the area no matter what I tried, so I was constantly having to hide, wait for him to leave before trying again. It wasn't scary, it was just annoying. Unlike some people however, I don't find Soma's gameplay to be a complete waste of time. I mean sure, the monster encounters might not be all that scary, but at least they break up the gameplay in a meaningful way. They force you to take things slow and think about your next move, which is more than I can say for some other horror games. I also want to briefly touch upon Soma's puzzles before I continue speaking about the game's plot. So when you're not running away from the various monsters that call this place home, you'll more than likely be engaging with one of Soma's many puzzles. Just like in Resident Evil and Silent Hill, many of these puzzles are logic based, with most of them not posing too much of a challenge. However, I did find one or two of them to be frustratingly cryptic, including this one where you need to essentially run a simulation without going over the machine's memory limit. One sequence in particular might be among my favourite puzzles in any video game ever. Not because it's especially challenging to solve, it isn't, but because of how this puzzle is seamlessly integrated into the plot of the game. But I'll come back to that particular sequence later. Getting back to the plot though, Simon continues to explore the facility and meets yet another robot that is behaving as if it's actually human. Simon is understandably confused by all this, since all he can see before him is a robot in a serious state of disrepair. The robot is convinced he is human however, and begs Simon to help him off the ground. This right here is one of the key themes of Soma. What does it actually mean to be human? We are living in an age where questions like this need to be asked. Computers and machines have developed to the point where they are on the precipice of becoming self-aware. It's not unreasonable to assume that in a decade or two from now, machines won't be all that different from us. And that will beg the question, should machines have the same human rights as everyday normal people? There's an excellent, albeit slightly fucking terrifying episode of Black Mirror that tackles this subject in depth, and I urge you all to check it out. I mean, even though this robot doesn't have a human body, it still talks and behaves like a human. It's still self-aware and has a consciousness. The only thing that really differentiates Simon from this machine is that Simon still has a human body. Or at least, he believes he still has a human body. As he continues to explore the facility, Simon begins to find the dead bodies of several Pathos 2 researchers. By touching their bodies, Simon is able to hear their last moments before death. Everything is wired evenly. We've hedged our bets as much as we possibly can. So that's it. Enough power to run Pathos 2 until the next apocalypse. We're ready to go. I really hope we didn't mess anything up. I don't want to have to come back here again. Relax, it's over. We're going to Theta. Maybe we should seal more blocks. I don't trust the helpers to let this place run in peace. We've sealed everything. Everything from the barracks to the comm center. If anyone ever sets their foot here again, they're gonna have a hell of a time getting a rock off. <laughs> Simon doesn't understand why he is able to do this, but thankfully, he's about to get some answers to these questions. Upon arriving in this dome-shaped room, Simon reconnects with the woman he spoke to earlier, where she introduces herself as Catherine Jun, and explains to him that it is currently the year 2104, and that the Earth's surface was completely decimated by a comet a year ago which also wiped out 99% of the planet's population in the process. 
During this conversation, the room Simon finds himself in starts flooding, and it seems inevitable that he is about to drown. However, just as all hope seems lost, Simon miraculously finds himself in a diving suit. Although what is actually happening here is that Simon has finally accepted the reality of what he is. He is also a robot, just like the machines he met earlier. His mind just wasn't willing to accept such a horrifying idea yet. Again, this moment stopped me in my tracks and made me contemplate what actually makes us human. The Simon from the beginning of the game and the Simon that awakens in this underwater facility are practically identical when it comes to their mannerisms and personality, yet they are two entirely different people. And in actuality, one of them isn't a person at all, he's a machine. If a robot is able to replicate a real human's behaviour so accurately, well, what makes us so different to them? More and more people are beginning to accept the reality that the world we currently find ourselves living in might not actually be real, and that what we perceive as reality might actually only be a computer simulation, created by life forms far more advanced than us. I mean, the idea doesn't actually seem that crazy when you really start to think about it. Video games have only been around for a few decades, and yet the technology powering these games has advanced so far in such a short time frame. We now have virtual reality, motion controls, and AR games. Is it really such a stretch to imagine that a thousand years from now, we might actually be able to simulate life itself? And if all this is true, and we are all just living in a simulation, doesn't that make all of us just machines in a way too? I usually don't like thinking about this stuff too extensively, because it kind of freaks the fuck out of me, but Soma really thrives in making you contemplate the nature of your existence, and the horrific questions that surround it. At least you don't need to worry about any of this shit, isn't that right, Pillow? Who am I? Why can't I move? Why can't anyone hear my cries for help? Haha, <laughs> you sure don't. So now that Simon realises he can move about underwater without the risk of drowning, he decides the best way to reach Site Lambda is by simply walking there himself. This leads to the first of many sequences where you leave Pathos 2 and explore the ocean floor on foot. Honestly, these sections of Soma always bored me to tears. There simply isn't anything worthwhile to see or do during these underwater sequences. You are simply moving from one part of Pathos 2 to another. Occasionally, you may need to avoid a harmful robot or solve a basic puzzle, but that's about it. Eventually, Simon reaches Site Lambda, and after avoiding another creepy monster, he finally meets Catherine, or at least a robot that has Catherine's consciousness stored within it. Simon is surprisingly disappointed to find out that Catherine is just a robot, even though he's technically a robot himself. He seems to have this idea in his head that robots do not have the capacity for complex thoughts or emotions, that they just aren't equal to humans. But despite what Simon might believe, Catherine comes across as an extremely intelligent and witty individual. She is clearly more than just another stupid robot. Catherine tells Simon that she still has a very important task to complete, and asks for his help. So before the human Catherine died, she was working on a project called the Ark. Since practically everyone on Earth is now dead, and there's no hope left for the human race, Catherine wanted to accomplish one last task before her species was wiped out entirely. She wanted to create a computer simulation where the crew of Pathos 2 could live on happily for another few thousand years. To accomplish this, she scanned the minds of everyone on board Pathos 2 and stored them on a computer called the Ark. She then planned to launch the Ark out into space on a satellite where it would be safe from all the carnage and destruction currently taking place on Earth. Unfortunately, Catherine was killed by another crew member before she could successfully launch the Ark, so now it's up to Simon to finish what she started. Simon agrees to help Catherine, if only because he doesn't want to die alone at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, surely if Simon uploads his consciousness to the Ark, 
he'll also get to live on in a computer simulation for thousands of years. Right? This is the point in the game where the pacing really started to improve, and I was actually finding myself enjoying the exploration and puzzle solving sequences. I also loved the developing relationship between Simon and Catherine in the game. Initially, the two of them don't seem very fond of each other, but only a few hours later, you could easily imagine these two people being best friends had they met under different circumstances. Their conversations are very well written, and even thought provoking at times. You're really good back there, Simon. We got a slight delta detour, but we're back on track. Yeah. We should touch down on a cargo platform just outside Theta. Then we just head inside, grab the dot back, and head down the abyss. 4,000 meters. That's a long way. We don't have to worry though, because with the dot back, the Ark could have been in the Mariana Trench. It'll hold for anything. That's great. And then we can start listening to other people when they talk because that's how conversations work. What? Wow. Sorry. I, I just can't stop thinking about what we've become. It's clear that we're no longer human. But then how can I feel like Simon? How can I feel like anything at all? I mean, technically, I don't have any ears, no mouth. Christ, it's a weird thing to think about. I mean, I'm making sounds. I'm still saying things. You sure are. So while exploring the rest of Patos 2, Simon begins to piece together how he ended up in this place, and why the facility seems so abandoned. So as it turns out, most of the crew of Patos 2 committed suicide once Catherine had scanned their minds onto the Ark, believing that doing so would allow them to continue living a peaceful, happy life on board the Ark. Of course, that isn't how things work in the real world. In reality, the scans of the crew aboard the Ark might as well be entirely different people. They are copies of the original crew's consciousness. So essentially, everyone on board Patos 2 committed suicide for no reason, believing a better life awaited them aboard the Ark. However, there's an artificial intelligence aboard Patos 2 called the WOW, and its main function is to keep the people on board the facility alive at any cost. So when the crew begin committing suicide, the WOW decided to step in to try and fix things. This is why you find certain people hooked up to machines and inside robots. The WOW is trying everything it can to keep the crew of Patos 2 alive, and if it has to shove someone's consciousness inside a broken robot to accomplish that goal, it will do that. This also explains the strange hostile monsters you've been encountering this whole time. They are simply the crew members that were unlucky enough to be a part of the WOW's strange experiments. Simon later discovers that his consciousness has been stored on a computer aboard Patos 2, and that the WOW decided to resurrect him in order to create new human life. This story is so fucking complicated to explain, I swear to God. He also finds a few audio logs featuring the last conversations between himself and Dr. Munchie. The model was sound. It should have worked. It's not your fault, David. I really wish things had turned out differently. Yeah, me too. I was supposed to save you. Hey, you got my brain on file. Maybe you can put it to some use. <laughs> yeah, who knows? You'd be okay with that? Using it for my research? Sure. It's like a part of me lives on or something. Like a donated organ. You know what sucks about dying? What? The crash. Everything up till now. The brain damage. You guys, everything. It's made my life so much more real. I started thinking about all the things I was going to do. I'd never been more excited to be alive. All that hope. Wasted. So unfortunately, the Simon from nearly 100 years ago eventually died from his brain injuries after Dr. Munchie's experiments proved unsuccessful in finding a cure for his rapidly deteriorating health. 
In their last conversation, Simon gives Munchie permission to use his brain scan in future, in the hopes that eventually he might be able to develop a cure. So finally things are beginning to make sense. The Simon from the beginning of the game, and the Simon from Pathos 2, are not the same person. The Simon we've been playing as for the last several hours is simply a copy of the Simon from Toronto's consciousness. This should be obvious to most people by this point in the game. However, there is one person who is not grasping the idea that he is a copy, and that person is Simon himself. There is a puzzle about halfway through Soma that perfectly sums up how clueless Simon is to everything that is going on around him. Simon and Catherine need to find a certain code to continue on their journey. Unfortunately, the only person who knows the code is dead. Thankfully, his consciousness has been stored aboard Pathos 2, so all Simon needs to do is run a simulation and get this guy's scan to cough up the code. However, things don't go to plan. The man realises that he isn't aboard the Ark, gets upset, and refuses to cooperate. Mr. Wan. Chud? What happened to you? I, I can't see anything. There's nothing here. It's okay. It's all a part of the scam. No, no, that, that's a lie. You're lying. Okay, calm down, Mr. Wan. No, 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 no. Well, why, are you, why are you doing this to me? I trusted you, Chun. I trusted you! Did we just bring that guy to life? I mean, he's a perfect scan, meant for the Ark. He's the real deal. Simon runs the simulation again and again, using different stimuli each time, in the hopes of convincing this guy that he actually is on the Ark. Eventually, Simon is able to create a simulation that works, and he gets the code. What he doesn't realize, however, is that he has essentially killed several different versions of this man in his desperate attempt to get the code. Every time he ran the simulation, he was essentially creating a new life, and then snuffing it out moments later. Simon simply doesn't comprehend the idea that a copy of someone's consciousness is a different consciousness entirely, a different person entirely, and it is this level of ignorance that will eventually lead to Simon's downfall. I'll be honest, Soma fucked with my head more than I care to admit. This kind of shit terrifies me more than I let on. There is a scene in Final Fantasy VIII where a man named Laguna says something that has stayed with me ever since I first played the game. He is scared that if he goes to sleep, he'll wake up as someone else, and he even says out loud, please let me wake up in this bed. As crazy as it may sound, I worry about the same shit. I mean, what if the world around me is just a computer simulation, and when I go to sleep, the simulation ends? What if I wake up as someone else tomorrow without realising? I mean, Jesus, what if Yakuza 0 is just a simulation and when I wake up tomorrow it won't exist anymore? Are you not seeing how fucked up this is? Soma made me question every aspect of my existence, which is not a pleasant thing to do at the best of times. It made me realise that there's a good chance that we are living in a computer simulation, and that there might not be a god or an afterlife. And that was a very strange place for me to reach, because I used to be such a good, naive little Catholic boy. Were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark? According to scripture, the answer is yes. I knew it! I'm going to ace that history exam tomorrow. Towards the end of the game, Simon is tasked with descending down into the deepest depths of the Atlantic Ocean in order to retrieve the Ark. However, in his current state, he would not survive the intense pressure that would come with being so many miles underwater. So Catherine advises him to find a different body that would be able to withstand the pressure. He eventually finds a suit that would be perfect for the job at hand, and so he begins the arduous task of finding the components necessary to allow him to transfer his consciousness into this new body. Upon getting everything ready, Simon sits in a chair and begins the transfer process. Sorry about any discomfort. This should be over soon. It's like having your picture taken. But with the most expensive camera in the world. You know, Indians thought photos would steal their souls. In this case, they'd be right. <laughs> Run 
diagnosis or something? Yeah. What was that? No, I, it's just... Why was it still talking? It's the same like before. Catherine, why was he still talking? That's how it works, you know that. What do you mean? You know it's not magic. You were copied. Sleeping Simon in the Sea was copied, and now... You are here, just like Simon lived on in Toronto. God damn you, Kath. Two Simons? There can't be two Simons. What did you think would happen? That you were gonna take my mind and put it into another body, like a brain transplant. I'm sorry, it wouldn't work that way. You realize how messed up this is? Please, I didn't mean to upset you. How did you expect me to react to this shit? Please stop. You're fucking disgusting. So it turns out, Simon did not simply transfer from one body to another. He was copied. Which means there are now two Simons. The Simon who we've spent the last several hours playing as, and the new Simon, who will now have to complete the rest of the journey alone. Before moving on, the player is given a choice, to either kill the old Simon, or allow him to continue living, knowing that once he wakes up, he will be completely alone at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, with no hope of survival. Neither option is preferable, but I decided to end his suffering, as it seemed like the more humane thing to do. Soma doesn't feature multiple endings, so choices like this are essentially meaningless at the end of the day. However, that doesn't mean moments like this didn't stop me in my tracks and have me questioning the right course of action. If there's one thing Soma does really well, it's making you care about these fictional characters and their predicaments. After deciding what to do with the old Simon, we descend down onto the ocean floor to find the Ark. This next sequence is pretty much the only underwater section I enjoyed in the entire game. The creative monster design mixed with the pitch black darkness and isolating atmosphere in this area caused me to become more than a little freaked out at times. I just wish more of the gameplay had been this well developed. Eventually, after many more trials and tribulations, Simon finds the Ark and begins to load it onto the satellite. He will soon be free of this terrifying underwater prison and will get to live out the rest of his days in peace on board the Ark. Or at least, that's what he thinks. Okay, ready when you are. Just hit the button and we're off. But we need to transfer our minds to the Ark. We also need to make sure it launches at all, so I tied them to a single switch. Just push the button and we're off. <laughs> Turn and back. Thank you, Simon. Don't mess. It's an amazing thing you did. And I want you to know I appreciate it. Time. 20 seconds. What's the matter with the upload? Just give it a second. Thought you guys would have better bandwidth. the Ark. I saw it. It finished loading just before it launched. Yeah, I saw. Then why are we still here? Simon, I can't keep telling you how it works. You won't listen. You know why we're here. You were copied onto the Ark. You just didn't carry over. You lost the coin toss. We both did. Just like Simon and Omicron. Just like the man who died in Toronto a hundred years ago. No, no, no. This is bullshit. We came all this way. We launched the Ark. I know it sucks. But our copies are up there. Catherine and Simon are both safe on the Ark. Be happy for them. Are you crazy? We're gonna die down here with those fuckers living at large on a spaceship. They're not us. They're not us. I'm sorry you feel that way, Simon. I'm proud of what we did. 
make sure that something of the hundreds of thousands of years of human history survives, that something lives on. No, 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 no. Fuck this! Fuck you! Fuck this! Fuck you! Fuck you, Catherine! You lied! And I believed in you! I trusted you! You said we're getting on the fucking Ark! We are on the Ark, you idiot! I didn't lie! I can't be responsible for your goddamn ignorance! You fucking Ark! Catherine? Please don't leave me alone. Catherine? Catherine? As heartbreaking and fucked up as this ending is, it's hard to feel much sympathy for Simon when he remained so clueless up until the very last moments of the game. As expected, Simon did not transfer onto the Ark, a copy of his consciousness did, which means all that awaits this Simon now is a slow, lonely death in this dark, isolating abyss. It's a truly brutal ending that some people might find to be too cruel and depressing. But that's kind of the point of Soma's whole plot. Existence itself is cruel by its very nature. Just like Simon, most people like to believe in their own version of the Ark, a heaven created by an all-powerful and benevolent God. Even when science tells us that such a place is very unlikely to exist, we turn a blind eye to such an idea because the alternative is just too terrifying to imagine. Simon may come across as ignorant throughout the game, but I don't think many of us would have behaved much differently if we were in his shoes. There is a post credit sequence that thankfully is a bit more hopeful in nature. In this final scene, we see the Simon that has been transferred onto the Ark awakening in a beautiful garden where everything is seemingly perfect and nothing can go wrong. Catherine fulfilled her mission and kept some small part of humanity alive for at least another few thousand years. So that's Soma. Honestly, despite not being the biggest fan of its gameplay, Soma's story is so good that I would still probably place the game high in my list of favourite video games ever. No story has ever made me contemplate what it means to be human like this before. The themes explored in the game are actually kind of terrifying if you start thinking about them too much, but those are the kind of horror experiences I appreciate the most, where the terror doesn't come from the monsters or the blood and gore, but from the ideas it creates in your mind. Soma is an experience any fan of horror needs to play. In terms of its storytelling alone, it's a masterpiece.